everything worthwhile is an effort. And we celebrate it, but that might go away when the things overcoming the obstacles are no longer human beings. What happens to the motive force driving culture forward when examples of success have disappeared? I think the cultural implications of surrendering very difficult problems might be very significant, and we haven't really thought it through. So I guess I've always been interested in living phenomena. What makes life different from non-life? What makes the biological world distinct from the physical world? And one question is, what is life? And another question is, what is intelligent life? And is that distinction real? So I guess that's been my career, trying to understand what life is, uh, what biology is, what culture is, and how it manifests either intelligently um, or foolishly or stupidly. Um, my path to that question really comes from evolutionary theory and mathematics, trying to rigorously formalize the principles underlying living phenomena. Complexity science is a project aimed at unification, uh, trying to establish principles that are common to all adaptive systems. Um, and those adaptive systems could be biological, but they could be economical, uh, they could be technological. If you compare Maxwell's equations or Einstein's field equations or mathematical descriptions of the universe, you can fit them on one page. You can open a book and you can say, ah, that's the special theory of relativity. Or you can open 30 pages and say, that's the standard model of physics. But what is the book in which you could inscribe a human being or an economy? It would take a library. And complexity uh, seeks to find a language or a framework in which to encapsulate as elegantly as possible a library of diversity. Uh, perhaps a theorem of the future is presented in the form of a computer program, not in the form of a mathematical proof. Um, so these are the issues that we wrestle with, trying to find the appropriate framework that respects the true complexity of adaptive phenomena that give us insights, an understanding of mechanism, and possibly even prediction, and ultimately some form of control. Uh, this has been a success in the physical sciences, and the question is, will it be the great success of the complexity sciences of the 21st century? I mean, everyone is familiar with the idea that technology assists us in our scientific inquiries, telescopes, microscopes, computers, slide rules. Um, but there are ideas that assist us in our inquiries. Most obviously, mathematics, the calculus invented by Newton and Leibniz. Complexity science seeks mental technologies, um, styles and rigorous forms of reasoning that will allow us to confront the complexity of adaptive phenomena. And some of the more obvious instances or examples of that are um, theories of collective computation, agent-based modeling, network theory, scaling theory. These are all frameworks that try to be true to the complexity of the phenomena that they're studying in distinction to using a traditional framework that has been very effective at dealing with a very regular phenomena, like the orbits of the planets, but that would be in some sense inadequate for dealing with the phenomena that we care about here. So ideas are technologies. Um, they're not physical artifacts, but they're cultural artifacts that pass from one person to another and allow us to more efficiently encode reality. 
for you, what is technology and how has our approach to it changed in the last centuries? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so technology is a part of humanity and it always has been. Uh, after the, you know, revelations of Darwin and Watson and Crick, where we discovered that we were biologically really not any different from the mouse <laughs> and are essentially identical to other great apes, um, the question naturally arose, what is it that makes our species different? It's not really biology. And, um, and I think it's a question that we're still wrestling with. I would argue that one of the things that might make this species different, if that's even an interesting question, quite frankly, um, is technology. And what is that? And in a way, they are means of minimizing effort or work, energetic, informational, temporal, And they've been around for as long as we have any evidence of human settlement. And whether you call the technology an arrowhead or a petroglyph, um, evidence of fire, of funerary customs, there are means in which, or by which we have mobilized society to solve problems efficiently that would be very difficult for us to solve on our own. And I think they must have come as a shock to every society that was introduced to them. I always talk about the incredible revolution in writing in the Fertile Crescent, the Sumerian play tablets. There's been a lot of talk about the singularity, uh, a consequence of miniaturization in silicon chips, that at some point the memory capacity and the processing speed will be sufficient for human beings or some other organism to create a simulacrum of themselves in a computer. But humans already did that <laughs> in Sumeria in the third millennium BC, when they inscribed their thoughts in clay, in cuneiform using a reed, there was some version of you, some dilute version of you, in a physical artifact. It wasn't all of you, but there never will be all of you, because even a downloaded, downloaded version of your mind would lose your physical body. So I call that the first singularity. And it wasn't a singularity that came from the silicon chip. It came from the silicate chip, <laughs> the clay chip. And history has been, in some sense, a whole series of inventions that have allowed us to create or deposit versions of ourselves. Think about novels. Uh, think about the Epic of Gilgamesh. It is a distillation of emotional, moral, ethical ideas that society was obsessing over. And for people to have access to those ideas in distilled form must have been revolutionary. There's been a huge amount of discussion, and Plato discussed it at length, about the merits and demerits of writing, because writing and outsourcing memory to physical artifacts would detract from the human need to cultivate memory and recall. And that this would undermine society because we'd become indolent. And so throughout history, over and over and over again, we have been confronting ourselves with means of minimizing our effort and enhancing our capabilities which in the most generic sense, I think, is what we mean by technology. Is the technology that we have now qualitatively different from the technology of, for example, the steam engine 
in, in the Industrial Revolution? And I think that's a very difficult question to answer, honestly. I think what is different is the number of human beings on the planet, right? And to the extent that human ingenuity scales non-linearly in the number of people, there are returns to scale, then it's possible that the rate at which we develop new technologies might be vastly faster than they were in previous centuries. I think that is a difference because we see it with our own eyes. I mean, over the course of our lifetimes, we've seen companies emerge and disappear over the course of a few years. Um, think about research in motion, the BlackBerry. I mean, that was such an extraordinary invention. And now it's gone, you know. And we could say that about many, many things. Kodak would have been an earlier example and, and so on. Um, MySpace would have been a later one. I think that's different. And if you had traveled back to the 18th century or the 19th century, people would still be using ink and fountain pens. And, um, and that would be true for hundreds of years. So I think, I don't know if it's the quality of the technology, although we should get to computing, which might be different, um, but rather the rate at which new technologies emerge and how we cope with the speed of exposure, I feel that might be different. And I think the evidence suggests that it is. It's an open question, what happens to humans in all of this system of rapid change? Um, I think these are really social ethical questions about how we want to live um, and how much effort we want to exert in our lives. I think there's no doubt that with computing technology and robotics, as that gets better very quickly, the kinds of exertions and professions that we've had will start to dry up. And the question is, what is left for us to do with our time? And how do we fairly redistribute the wealth? <laughs> Maybe we'll return to some of the dominant questions of the 19th century. Um, we'll explore alternative political forms because time will be on our side. We'll be in a position to reflect very carefully on what a good life means. I mean, in some sense, this was the Socratic question, right? And um, it was a question that was restricted to an aristocratic elite. What happens when billions of people are in a position to ask, how should we live our lives, given that some of the drudgery has been absorbed by technologies? It's a very big question. Um, I think there are some clues in, in some of the more wealthy industrialized societies and they're not all positive. I think a lot of people spend a lot of time wasting their minds, uh, seeking out very shallow entertainments. This gets to a fundamental principle of nervous action, that the nervous system is an energy minimizer. Um, it doesn't want to work if it doesn't have to. And there are many good examples of how that's played out. And if you gave someone the opportunity to completely opt out, to avoid all difficulty, most would willingly take it. And what happens then? I, mean, I, you know, I don't know. I would make a distinction between a technology that makes an essential function manageable a technology that replaces an essential function and a technology that introduces a new one. And maybe one of the dis distinctions between, for example, the extraordinary benefits of the wheel or the papyrus scroll, you know, or the steam engine, is that they allowed us to do what we had to do more easily, more reliably, and more efficiently. 
Whereas many of the new technologies aren't necessarily replacing an existing requirement. They're creating something novel. Um, so if you look at it, platforms, to what extent is effortless search essential, say a Google, or a vast social network, say a Facebook? It's true that it's an extension of something we already had and that we already needed, but it's taken to a scale that's so far beyond our reckoning that I would call it almost a new function. And um, that feels very different to me, qualitatively differently, or different from beasts of burden um, that would allow us to transport heavy matter from a mine, for example. Uh, those are things that we could barely do these are things that we barely need. We have this vast Lego bo uh, box now that we can draw on to build almost anything we, ima we could possibly imagine. And, um, but doing that well is an art. Um, you know, we have sophisticated mathematics. We have probability theory. We have algebraic geometry. We have group theory. And well, they're out there. <laughs> But we still are living with a theory, Einstein's general theory, and the theory of quantum mechanics that have not been reconciled for 100 years. And we have all those tools. We can deploy them effortlessly at almost zero cost. But no one's had an idea that really has taken us much further than they did 100 years ago. So I think the real discussion has to do with the quality of what you produce and not the effortlessness with which you produce it. And the fact is most software is garbage. And um, it's a constant source of annoyance in my life, in my field, that I have to work with software developed by people who don't understand the nature of mind, um, who are designing things that they like, imposing them on the rest of us, uh, where we have needs which are quite different. So in fact, I'm, I'm much less impressed <laughs> by the modern world of software design than many. Large companies, Google and Facebook, will only really invest in projects that have very considerable markets. And they're companies, that, that's totally logical for them. But products that have very considerable markets are usually not very interesting products, unless they're penicillin, for example, you know, in which case they are. Um, but most of us are different, and we don't all want to dress identically. We don't all want to read the identical books, but we all have to use the identical software. And there is a level of homogeneity in the mass production of modern technologies that I think runs counter to the grain uh, of human difference and diversity. And it would be a very interesting exercise to think about how we could create technologies that are responsive to individual difference instead of mass producing software of limited value that everyone has to adopt. I think it requires a lot of thought in areas where human creativity is of particular interest. And so that's why I talk about software. I mean, I, I often think about word processors, for example. Um, everyone is using the same one. And it is dictating the form that channel your ideas. Um, you could say it doesn't matter. I mean, everyone was using the same typewriter at the turn of the century, the last century. That didn't limit the creative potential of a Philip Roth or a Saul Bellow uh, or a Cormac McCarthy. Uh, but something feels a little different about this time, especially with AI, right? Because it starts to tell you what you should do and think. This is how you should present your ideas. Oh, this is the correct grammatical construct. Oh, and by the way, here are some ideas from Wikipedia that bear on the narrative that you're creating. So there are forces of homogeneity in play that might have not been present in earlier technologies. One way of looking at um, human cultural evolution is a series of inventions that overcome 
limits. We've talked about the wheel, um, we talk about fire. All of these are means of accomplishing some desired goal that we couldn't have accomplished without them. When we think about a fork or a knife or a screwdriver, there are things that you can't do with your hands that you can quite effortlessly do once you have a knife. So technology overcomes limits. Even cognitive limits, if you think about the great paradoxes of classical antiquity, Zeno's paradox, the tortoise and the hare, logical paradoxes, these were overcome by the technologies of logic and mathematics. And obviously physical limits have been overcome by mechanical machines, by machinery. What seems novel now is that one of the limits that we did not expect technology to help us with is actually being confronted by AI. And that's limits to prediction, limits to explanation, and limits to understanding. We now have machines that are better at predicting based on very large data sets and significant computing power fairly circumscribed domains of activity. They're still not very good at the weather. Our history is better at the weather than machines for the long run. Um, in other words, looking at this place a month, a year, a decade in the past, it's more revealing of its future than uh, machine learning algorithms that take into account lots of data. On the other hand, face recognition, language recognition, um, classifying rudimentary cell tissues, cell cultures, are things that machines do better than us. So thus far, where we are now, classification, a certain kind of uh, taxonomy, is something that's performed very well by machines. Explanation is terra incognita. Machines are very bad at explaining their decisions to us, which is something we seem to require. So if you asked a computer, why do you think that person is going to be a criminal? Why do you think that person has embezzled, always using insider trading, based on some anomaly detection in stock market or finance time series? It can't tell you. It says, I have a large data set. <laughs> I'm using all sorts of interesting regressive technologies. But the theory, the internal data structure is so huge, there would be no way of conveniently expressing that insight. So when it comes to explanation, they get a fail. And society is asking itself, does it matter? Now, when we went to school, and we put down the answer to a question, we had to explain how we got there. Because there was always a concern that we might have cheated, or we might have stumbled upon the right answer. Well, let's say that they're not cheating, and they're not stumbling on the right answer. Does it matter if they cannot explain how they got there? But then you get to understanding. This is the deepest of all the limits. And explanation is one thing. But I can explain something to you without really understanding it. I mean, I could have read somewhere online how long division works. And you say, yes, but why does that really work? Right? Well, I can explain to you how to integrate a function, teach you how to do it, but I might not really understand it. I'm just parroting the rule set, the algorithm, the procedure. Understanding is mysterious. We don't even know what it means, uh, but we know it's important. Um, we like to understand our place in the universe. We like to understand what makes us content. Uh, we want to understand where the world is leading us. And we're now living in an age where we're confronted with significant limits in understanding. And um, I think the first instance of this associated with technology came with 
our attempts to understand the invisible world, uh, the microscopic world of the atom, uh, or the cosmological, astronomical world of, of space. And we had to build instruments to give us a means of perceiving those worlds. And the combination of that enhanced perception and the technologies of mathematics gave us what we would call an understanding, a new language to express them. I think the open question <laughs> is, will the limits to our understanding ever be transcended by technologies, or will technologies make understanding irrelevant? And I think that's the answer, um, especially these technologies. There was a big difference between mathematics and machine learning. Mathematics gives you a manageable heuristic with which to reason through a problem. A big machine algorithm spits out an answer and In complex phenomena, our desire for prediction and control will overwhelm our need to understand. And we already see evidence of this. I mean, if I was running a hedge fund, who would I rather hire? A machine learning algorithm that could accurately predict the vagaries of future markets, or an economist who could explain to me, using a reasonable theory, why the world works as it does, but he was not very good at predicting. Well, if I'm running a hedge fund, I'm hiring the AI. If I'm a university administrator, I probably want to hire the economist. And there's this bifurcation that's taking place now. And that might be an interesting, unique property of our time. It used to be that one person did both. You were an expert at understanding which made you an expert at explaining and predicting. Now we might need all three. We might need experts at predicting, machines, experts at explaining, neo-journalism, and experts at understanding, philosophers. They're not the same thing. And I think this period is making that distinction very clean and clear to us. And we, I think, still live with the inertia of the expectation that they can all be solved by one person. Do you think we're overestimating what machines can do? It's, it's tough. I mean, it, we're still living in an age where the machines are essentially reflecting the constraints of cognition. Um, just to make this tangible, um, our visual system has a very strong preference for horizontal and vertical geometry. This is called an obliqueness bias. And this was true in the abacus, because the abacus is laid out that way, but it's also true in a typewriter when you type left to right on horizontals. And it's true in our computers, where all of our text processors and word processors present the text in that form. There is no word processor I know of that has you writing on diagonals. <laughs> right for a reason. <laughs> the reason is that your brain prefers that. So the technologies are reflecting biological constraints and biases. The same goes for font design, the same goes for the range of, of audible you know, stimuli, and so on and so forth. And so they still have a trace of their human origin, you know, and um, which goes some way towards our understanding them. But will that be necessary in the future? I think that's the question. And will we have to be experts in the tools? I mean, you go to a carpenter. A carpenter understands uniquely how to use a lathe, has a skill um, that's been cultivated over years. And this is something that we deeply respect. Craftsmanship, whatever word we use for it. Um, maybe that's on the wane, maybe that's on the way out, because they'll no longer have the imprint of their biological origins, because they'll be talking to each other.
I think this is the key, the key issue, this, this issue of what limit is the technology transcending? And I think when it was transcending the energetic limits, it was one thing. When it was transcending the communicative limits, it was another. But when it's transcending the intelligence limits, where notions of explanation and understanding are core, this is difficult for us to think about. Um, these are not things we're willing to forfeit as easily. Right? If you said, I'll make your life safer by having a robot inspect a submerged nuclear facility, no one in their right mind would say no. But if I said to you, don't worry about thinking about the well-being of your family, because I have an algorithm that will take care of all of that for you, you would quibble <laughs> or reject the offer. Because it seems to be integral to who you are. So in some sense, these technologies might be infringing upon identity. If you think about, if you compare the big data revolution in terms of social data to the big data revolution in physics, the decadal surveys most recently, but going back to the scientific revolution and astronomical measurement, it still took several hundred years to go from Tycho Brahe through Kepler, Newton, Leibniz, through to Einstein, One of the positive implications of having this kind of data is it might generate new theories of what collectives really are. Um, it's one thing to classify the data and use it as a source of prediction for market analysis and sales and advertising. But it's another thing to use it to construct an entirely new way of understanding the nature of, of, of humanity. And, um, and I suspect that will happen. In fact, it's partly what we do here, right? I mean, part of our effort is to say, could the kinds of data being collected by these companies serve the same function for our understanding of behavior as the astronomical data did for understanding of celestial mechanics? That's the positive spin on this. And the objective is all important. Newton and Galileo were not trying to make money. They were trying to understand the fundamental nature of reality. And they needed that data and the mathematics to accomplish that. Now we're in a strange situation where it's as if the East India Company owned every telescope on Earth and all of the data that was being acquired was being used to plot more effective trade routes and not being given to the scientists to analyze the underlying laws of life or the underlying laws of physics. Uh, but we could. We could. And perhaps there will be, I mean, I think there is evidence in the open data movement um, of an impulse or desire on, on the part of society to make that data available to people to make real progress in understanding. Um, yeah. when working with technology or thinking about it, what has surprised you? Oddly enough, not so much. I mean, my surprise is how persistent superstition and data phobia are. So on the one hand, we have this obsession with big data and computing power and prediction and AI. And at the same time, the denial of fundamental truths, like the fact of evolution, and very likely hypotheses, like climate change. And why is it that we have such an extraordinary enthusiasm for data in the dimension of our economic life and our hedonistic exertions, but are so suspicious of it when it comes to fundamental understanding. That's something that confuses me a great deal. 
Um, and I suspect the answer lies at the interface of understanding and economic opportunity. If climate science was of no threat to any market, everyone would embrace it. And so how do we come to understand that? And that's an issue in complexity, I think. One of my concerns, and I keep coming back to this because I really believe in it, has to do with laziness and indolence. Um, everything worthwhile is an effort. And we celebrate it. We celebrate it in sport. We go to watch people who have dedicated their lives to doing extraordinarily difficult things. We go... We celebrate it in chess, because it's hard to be a grandmaster. And we celebrate it in scholarship. We talk about people like Einstein and Darwin, because they solve very hard problems. And that has been the history of humanity, a deep respect for overcoming obstacles, in a way. But that might go away when the things overcoming the obstacles are no longer human beings. If all the hard problems or many hard problems are being solved in a non-explanatory, non-understanding, but highly predictive way, what happens to the motive force driving culture forward? The desire to solve hard problems. When our role models have gone, <laughs> when examples of success have disappeared. Um, I think the cultural implications of surrendering very difficult problems might be very significant. And we haven't really thought it through. Um, most of us, me, you, almost everyone else I can think of, is fundamentally motivated by the idea of accomplishing something hard if you're lucky enough to be in that position, not everyone is. Um, what if everything hard <laughs> goes away? <laughs> right. um, that seems to be a, a, a very troublesome idea and it's not one that I even know how to think about. Um, and perhaps that lethargy will generalize to contexts where it would be dangerous, for example, well, ethical issues of bias or inequality, various kinds, where well, that's just a question that we don't have to deal with, difficult questions we don't deal with. We leave those, we leave those to corporations and machines. And, um, but I would argue that's the essence of being a human. I think the only thing that just might distinguish us from the rest of animate nature is that focus on future problems, on future aspirations. And, you know, and, and the public still has that great enthusiasm. We think about our enthusiasm for space. Um, these are very hard problems still. We still can't effortlessly get people onto the moon. And it's a, it's a satellite of the Earth. It's right there. But we can't do it. And I think it fascinates us. Why can't we do it? And there are still people out there trying to make that happen. And it's not a question of escape. It's not a question of um, ignoring pressing problems on the planet. It's a question of confronting our destiny, which is confronting difficult problems in order to explain and understand them. That is what it means to be human. And it has been the history of technology to help us in that enterprise, not to hinder us. You develop a complete awareness of what the technology can and cannot do. And you work with its constraints. I mean, the most creative things we do are working with constraints. I mean, the great paradox of poetry and verse is that we impose the constraint of prosody on ourselves to express the inexpressible. It seems, it seems ridiculous, you know? but that's what we do. The paintings we admire are an attempt to achieve realism or abstraction on a stubborn medium using oils to 
present the likeness of somebody. And that's always been true. And I think um, a great chef, right, creating something out of very little and so constrained and our struggle with it is probably the essential ingredient of invention. What happens when constraints go away? Um, I would claim invention goes away, creativity goes away. A mature relationship to these technologies would be to engage fully with their constraints and to turn them into assets. But that means an understanding of them and time to develop an experiential familiarity with them. But what if the technology is changing every week? I think that's why a lot of people are still drawn to the analog, to vinyl or uh, to, to film, um, because they know what they're working with and they know they develop a model of how that uh, world works, which is, as I said earlier, an understanding, which is the essence of creative production. If the technology is a black box, there's no possibility of expertise. You're just a user, like everybody else. And the whole concept of a creative individual, the artist, the scientist, evaporates. Um, so I would say a mature relationship to technology is taking the time to develop a familiarity with its constraints and rejecting an alternative technology that overcomes those constraints for you. It comes back to my earlier point about what we value most. This is moral. If you value prediction, then the black box is great. And we all value prediction up to a point. But some of us also value other things too. <laughs> and uh, if you value those other things, understanding and explanation, consequence, invention, creativity, then they're not so great. And um, I think this is a social debate and discussion. I think it is the responsibility, to be honest, of people like us to show people the value of those other things. There is great pleasure to be had in understanding things. Um, there's great pleasure to be had in being creative. Um, and I'm optimistic about technology in that respect. I always thought, if you think about games like Minecraft, I mean, why is Minecraft so fascinating to kids and, and adults? Because you develop an understanding of the physics. So you can build things that the designers didn't build for you. That's a world away from other software interfaces where you're given everything and you have no access, access to the underlying mechanics. The, we want that access. We want to understand how things work because we want to build new things. If we're, a, if we're a, a, an inventive and creative society, we need to have access to the, to the inside of the black box. Um, and if you just look at kids, they enjoy it. There's a love of that. There's a, there's a pleasure in that. Um, I think if we really forfeit that, then it's all over. The discussion is being had, and I think there are certain economic interests that want to convince us that that's desirable. But I think we're too clever to accept it. I think the kids are too clever to accept it. And I think the creative people are too clever to accept it because they understand what allowed them to succeed, and it was taking apart, ripping apart the black box. It was seeing what this wire did when you connected it to that one, seeing what that cog did when you connected to that lever and to that gear. I mean, we're curious people, and we like to take things apart to understand how they work. And sometimes we can't reassemble them, um, but we always learn something. And for someone to tell us that the ultimate value is prediction using someone else's instrument um, is not compelling, I think, to the great majority of people. Once they've in learned how to enjoy that exploration, if you deny them that, then they'll never know what they're missing. And I think there are economic forces that would like us to not know what we're missing, uh, but it's our role to defy them. 
I mean, there are, I think there are often two approaches to science, right? There's the approach to science that produces an outcome that is of utility. And then there is an approach to science that says, the world and the universe are mysterious, and I'm going to increase your sense of wonder. That's the kind of science I'm interested in. It leads to the other kind of science, but that's not the goal. And people forget that, and I think it's partly the way science is taught. And not just science, all forms of scholarship. It's not about fact. It's not about utility. It's about understanding. Understanding leads to utility. And again, we live at this intersection where those two objectives have become disjoint. It's now possible to achieve utility without understanding. That's the discussion. That's the debate. That's what your film is about, it seems to me. Um, and we need to reckon with it. Uh, but in my experience, if you take someone to a great movie, or you play them a beautiful piece of music, they derive extraordinary pleasure from it. And it's no different whether that's science or art or physical activity. It's all the nervous system expressing itself. We shouldn't deny ourselves that. Um, and I'm very confident, actually, about humanity in that respect. I think that um, I think once people have experienced that, they return to it. What we need to do is be better at giving people access to it. Let's imagine I gave you a game that you could never lose. You'd never play it. Past the age of five, tic-tac-toe is no longer of interest to you. Well, in England, they call noughts and crosses. Yeah. Chess remains interesting to you. Go remains interesting to you. Maybe not to deep mind, but it is, remains interesting to us. Why? Why is a game, an effortless game, at which you can never lose, immediately boring, whereas a game where there's a prospect of losing and learning is interesting? The same goes for sport. Lifting a peanut is not an interesting sport. Playing basketball is. Why? Because it's hard. Because you don't score a basket every time you shoot the ball. That's this interesting sense of failure. We are motivated by complex tasks where there's the possibility of learning. People talk about a culture of failure, we need to be able to fail, but I think it's sort of missing the point. What we need to do is tantalize, amuse, and challenge our intellect, which includes our motor system, by the way. That's a better way to think about it. I, I think the analogy works. A game at which you could never lose, you would never play. A project which you, should never, you could never fail, you should never engage in. It's the same concept. It's not fear. Uh, it's something much deeper, which is there's nothing in there to learn. And what we want to do is always learn. That's what your nervous system was evolved to do. You're defying its need. That's why failure is interesting. Yeah. Something odd has happened that, that risk and failure are terms that are applied over here. And curiosity and learning over here. But they're twins. <laughs> I'm not interested in failure. I would like to succeed. I'd like to win if I played you in chess. But I want to learn. And we need a new vocabulary, I feel. I feel as if we're dealing with, with concepts that have sort of outlived their usefulness. And um, when I go to meetings with businesses and they say, we need to fail and fail and fail, I say, that's not a business I would invest in. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but if I go to a business that says, we need to learn, and we need to get better. Then it's interesting. But clearly, an element of learning is when your hypothesis is not correct. <laughs> is that failing? Not for me. It's the essence of science. So we just need new vocabulary here, I think. Just out of curiosity, how do you think a film about technology 
like the one I'm making could be most useful. I think a film like this, its, it's chief responsibility is to be honest. Um, and that means revealing as many of these dimensions as possible, I think. Um, the, there is a way in which ideas are presented which I think is very unfortunate. As I said before, this kind of packaged, hermetically sealed, mass-produced, you know, cellophane wrapped. And that's not what we want. Um, sort of fast food culture, fast food ideas, you know. You don't even know if it came from a real animal or a chemistry plant. Um, and so th to, to not give answers is the most desirable thing in the world. I think it's one of the reasons why education has failed. Um, because people think its job is to give answers, but it's not. <laughs> you know, the, the job of education is to give you the tools and the curiosity to seek them yourself. And it's so much harder. It's so much harder. Um, you know, it requ requires real effort to, to uh, motivate people to do that. And, and it requires, I think, as, as you're saying, some level of uncertainty. There has to be enough there for you to engage. It's like I said, there's no interest in you making a documentary about how to play tic-tac-toe. I'm not watching it. <laughs> no, don't need it. There has to be some residual uncertainty. There has to be a little space for me to play in and contribute to. And that's why answers are boring. Um, and it's another reason why the technologies that only give us answers are not interesting. That's why the black box is not interesting. Because it's just an answer. You know, and there are times you want answers, and there are times when you want to ask questions. And joy comes from asking questions and discovering, and not by g being given an answer by someone else. Um, so these are really deep, uh, deep psychological principles that we're dealing with here. And um, y they don't go away by just declaring that all that matters is predictive or financial success. You're an explorer. You're not a tour guide. <laughs> it's a different profession. And, um, you know, I don't want to go on a package holiday. I want to go on a journey. <laughs> different experience. Maybe this is kind of an interesting issue that historically, when you think about the emergence of movements, social movements and religions, they often emerged in periods of great uncertainty or doubt or oppression. Maybe we're going to be confronted with all three of those and have to rethink a little bit how to live. Um, I think it's no coincidence the resurgence of interest in mindfulness and reflective practices that seem in some sense a corrective to the thin, rapidly changing alternatives. Um, there is a kind of balance that we seek. There's a kind of conservation principle. And um, I mean, this happened in, in reading, you know, I mean, we had this absorption of all these beautiful, small, privately owned bookstores by the large bookstores. They then imploded under technological alternatives. And now there's a kind of renaissance of interest again. Human curiosity is like a weed. It just keeps growing, it keeps growing. You can try and mow it down, it'll just re-emerge. And, um, you know, we're our role, SFI's role, science role, scholars' role is to, is to support those weeds. <laughs> That, that's one way to think about it.